I'm uh, presenting on how to solve like these packet challenges with T-Shark. The idea was, uh, I had an idea at, at Shark with Europe when I was doing a packet challenge and I wanted to, to um, challenge myself in doing every, every question with T-Shark to see if that would work. And actually I think it's, um, it's a good practice to, with these questions to, uh, to practice your T-Shark uh, skills so that when you have a production traffic question that you're all, no, that, you, that you have the tools to do that with T-Shark in your environment too. Um, if you want to tag along with my, uh, my demos, you can go to the, um, you can get the files from my website. I'll leave it up for just a short minute. And um, who is going to do the packet challenge, by the way? Everyone, I hope. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's good practice. So actually, this time, uh, Christian made it. And uh, there's quite a few questions that are really hard to do if you don't use a T-Shark. So you're, you're in the right session. You makes life a lot easier for you. OK. Um, if everybody took a picture of the, of the URL, I'm going to proceed with uh, a little bit about me. I used Ethereal since the last millennium. Well, 1999, but still it's the last millennium. And I started developing in 2006 because I was missing, uh, I was missing functionality that I really want to use. So I started developing. And it got me active in the community, it got, got me to be a core developer. And back then I already started using a T Shark a lot. So when the first Shark Quest was coming along, people said, Oh, you should present on T Shark. So, well, so I did. <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. Um, I had a, the presentation that I did like for a couple of years. Um, it's still online in the retrospective page, so if you want to have a broader uh, introduction to T-Shark and all the command line tools, I advise you to look up my sessions from previous Sharkfests. So look at the retrospective page and, and you'll find it. And this session is more geared towards, okay, I have this practical question, how can I solve it? So it's maybe a little uh, easier, but we'll see, what, we'll see how it goes. So after first Sharkfest, this was uh, blocked by, um, I forgot his name, uh, it's a colleague of Scott Hoggall, but um, <laughs> it was really fun to see that online. Um, well, a little marketing, uh, I've got my own company since, uh, actually Sharkfest 2008, meeting people that were working for themselves, triggered me in starting to work for myself too. So. It's all, it's all nice that you, you start coding a little and from one thing leads to another and my life totally changed by it. So, so these are the packet challenges, two of them from, from previous uh, uh, Shark Fest. They were done by the Warshak University, so I thank Laura that I can use them. I asked her and she said, oh great, go do that. And um, so let's see how we can proceed. Solving problems is nice. But, or solving the challenge, packet challenge questions, but it's an extra challenge to solve them with a CLI one-liner. And I want to bank the one-liner in such a way that it, uh, it does not only get the answer, but it also rules out false positives for that specific capture file. But why not make it in a such a way that it's repeatable for any capture file asking, for answering the same question? I mean, the, the questions here are for specific capture files, so you can gear towards the answer that's in the capture file, but why not make it in a general way that you can use it for any capture file? And for me, um, it's easier on, to use Wireshark when you're exploring and testing because it's a GUI and you can click and, and it's visual, but you can do that with T-Shark as well if you, if you don't have uh, Wireshark on a system, you can do it with T-Shark, or if you just don't want to switch between GUI and, uh, and command line. So let's see how, how far we can get with this. Oh, for the Windows users, I'm, I'm using macOS, and a lot of people are using Linux, but the Windows users, uh, all the things that I'm doing are bash, ba bash based, bash shell. So you either need to have like Sigwin installed, like I did in the past when I was still using Windows, 
or these days in Windows 10 you can use the, the, the Windows subsystem for Linux doc documentation. Well, I haven't used it myself, but there's probably other people who use that in this audience. Yeah, a couple. If you have questions, go to them. <laughs> because I, I don't know how to set that up, but um, there's, there's people around here that can help you set that up if you need to. Any comments, any additions to that, Graeme, on how to use these things in Linux or in uh, Windows? Yes, yes. So, so the answer of Graeme is these are all bash based, but the, the principles are the same, so you can transfer them to, to PowerShell. You're not doing a CLI session. The, Graeme has done a great uh, PowerShell session uh, in Sharkfish Europe and other Sharkfests, so if you want to look at the PowerShell variants of this, Look up the Which presentation. Presentation done in PowerShell. Yeah. It was your presentation. I know, yeah, but I want to give you credit. <laughs> it's your presentation on PowerShell. <laughs> so, all right. So let's get started with the first challenge. This is uh, one from 2018 Europe, and let's see if this first question can be answered with T Shark. So we have the question: Which hosts do not support selective acknowledgments? enter each host's IP address. So we need to see which packets do expose this behavior or that we can use to give an answer, and which fields we can use. And I'm going to I put all things in the slides just for people that are going to download the slides later on. They, they have the slides, but uh, I, I might want to switch back and forth to, through T-Shark to do it live as well. But for this, um, well, let's do that. In, let's switch. Well, I'm going to talk about it. So the first command that I'm showing you here, the first, the, the bottom, the top one, I'm trying to find the first packet that has the sin flag set, and the behavior of the minus c operator or uh, command line argument in in T Shark has been changed. It used to be that it it, it counted after filtering, so it filters first, and then when it hits the first one. After filtering, it will stop, but now it's just a counter of the frame, so it's, it stops after the, after the th uh, first frame. And you can change that behavior by using the minus R, which is the, the read filter option instead of the display filter option. Um, but that needs um, a two-pass filtering process, as you can see by the deprecation of that, uh, the deprecation message. So when I do it with a minus two and a minus R, I get the first sin packet that's in the trace file. And I can expand on that by using the JSON output. And if I grab on uh, SAC permitted, like I'm outputting JSON output, so I get like the whole the section tree with field names and values. And if I grab on uh, SA say key, uh, so the SAC option, I get the field for, uh, that I can use to filter on SAC, or SAC permitted, actually. So this is one way of, oh, yeah. Okay, can you, there, there's two microphones, but. You're good? Okay. Oh, if anybody wants to ask a question, there's a microphone in the middle and a microphone on the right, and uh, um, Enzo asked me to use the microphone, so it will be in the recording as well. Also, it's pretty hard to hear it from up here. So, but do shout when you have a question. I like interaction, so um, it slows me down as well, which is good, because otherwise I will just ram through the presentation. Okay, um, so back to where we were. Um, this is one way of finding out what fields you can use, or if you don't know a field name by, by hand and you don't want to open a bar shark to, to look the, the field name up, you can, this is one way of getting the field name. Uh, so now I can extend my filter with not TCP options .sac permitted because that's a filter that will rule out all the sins that don't have, uh, that will show the, the sins that don't have the sac, option, sac permitted option. So in this case, you see that there's four packets matching the, uh, the filter. And if you remember the question right, it was give me all the IP addresses of the host not supporting SAC. 
So this is not the answer because it's not, it's not in the format of an IP address. So I need to transform this data to something that uh, is really giving the answer. Um, let's see, what's the difference? Oh, there's a, just a difference that if you look at the, the, the um, uh, line of the, the frame numbers, here I use the read filter first, and then I do use the display filter. So this means while reading packets, it will immediately discards all the packets that don't have the syn flag set, and then after reading, it will start uh, selecting the packets that don't have the, this option. And you can see that the line numbers or the frame numbers are lower because it dropped already a lot of packets. So the behavior of T-Shark is different in a, when you have, apply a, a read filter or when you apply a display filter. So usually I just supply display filters, but be aware that some things you need to have the uh, read filter. Or, and so, sometimes you need to have the, um, um, the two-pass process because when you're in Wireshark and you see that um, the response is in frame yeah, something, that means it looks ahead because it doesn't know yet, but it knows because it had a run through the, the file first. And then on the second run, it already knew when the response was. We will see that later in, in one of the examples. So if I add minus T fields and then minus E IP source, it means Wireshark is not going to print its default output, but Wireshark is going to print out just the fields that you're interested in. So in this case, I'm interested in the source IP address of this packet. So I do minus T fields minus E IP source. Well, that gives a list of four IP addresses, and I'm still not satisfied because I see that there's a duplicate in there. So I'm going to add sort minus U. By the way, that this, this pipe, this, this vertical bar is the pipe command, as we say. And that means take the output from the previous command and put that as an input to the next command. So that, that way you can chain things, like this creates some part of information, and you transform it with another command, and then you transform it with another command, and in the end you have the, the format that you need. And that's really what I like about uh, the command line tooling, because you can post-process everything that you need. So, oh, that was too quickly. So this is actually, I put it in red, this is the final answer to the question that we were trying to solve. So this command is uh, going to solve your problem. There is a caveat in here because um, if the client doesn't support SAC, this will not this will not work well. Uh, so if you pay attention, pay the attention. These are all Synax, and that means uh, all the, uh, the all the client uh, requests in this trace file, all the the, the syn packets, they all had SAC permitted enabled. At the last example that I will show you is when you want to rule those out as well. But that's more complex, so we'll come to that later. Another example. Which device appears to be an iPhone but does not request an IP address for 90 days? So anybody did this question earlier? Like this was, I'm not sure if this was in, uh, in Europe or in America for last year. How, how, how do you think we can go about solving this? Well, you open the trace file, you're going to look what, what's in the trace file, and there's a lot of DHCP traffic in the trace file. So, so what, could, what could we use, what kind of fields can we use to solve this? Any ideas? Now there's a couple of... HTTP user agents. Okay, that could be the case. But um, does a user agent require IP addresses or request IP addresses for 90 days? So we're, 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 we're the, the, the fact that we're requesting an IP address for 90 days gives a hint that we're talking about DHCP traffic. And within the options of DHA, DHCP traffic, there's always the host name of the client that wants to get an IP address. And the funny thing about, about iPhones, I'm, I'm an iPhone sucker as well, is that they are really like, oh, this is an iPhone. By default, it's like, uh, Laura's iPhone or Betty's iPhone or Saka's iPhone. Well, I changed it. It's not that anymore. But by default, it's just your name and then iPhone. So those devices are pretty easy to recognize on the network as long as they don't cha didn't change their, uh, their host name. So we can use DHCP and then the, the host name within DHCP. 
And so if you look at the, there's a field, I looked it up, I didn't, didn't show you how to look it up, but there's a field called DHCP option hostname. But that can be all uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, and I don't want to I don't want to compare all the options. So there's an option in Wireshark. So this is not T-Shark specific. This is just general display filter uh, syntax. To say, I want to take the output of this field, and I transfer it to lowercase before doing the comparison. And why do I need to do that? Because the contains comparison is case sensitive. So this way, I make the contains operator case insensitive which means I now can, can compare to just iPhone in, in uh, small letters. And as you can see, these are on the, the top five, but there's more of them. But there's DHCP messages in which the host name has iPhone in the output. Second stage is we want to have only those iPhones that don't request a 90-day um, lease time. Well, if you calculate 90 days, it appears that iPhones usually uh, ask for a 90-day lease time, which is kind of crazy because how, uh, but they, uh, they want to have their IP address for 90 days. Um, and that calculates to this amount of seconds. So if I combine those filters uh, and I do, again, the, the JSON output because I don't remember the name for the lease time, so you can see that uh, by outputting a JSON output and then uh, searching for lease, I just get this, this name and I already see that it's 90 days lease time for most of the requests. So now we can combine that into a filter where I say, I'm reading this file, I'm using a filter with two parts, like it needs to contain iPhone and it does not contain the lease time of Sorry about that. Uh, and it does not contain that lease time. Again, I'm going to sort it, and again, I'm going to unique it, because there can be multiple DHCP requests from the same client, and of course, they will show the same values. So again, now I have the three iPhones that did not request 90-day lease time. It's not very complex yet, but this is something you can reproduce. This is something you can script if you have, like, if you want to, uh, if you if you do full-time packet capture and you want to um, to extract indicators of compromise, you can run some TCRs command on your your traffic data on a scripted way and have them email the results so you don't have to do that yourself, which is a little bit difficult in in Wireshark because you have to click yourself. So this was just showing a couple of fields. Now let's see if we can count. There's a question, how many HTTP redirections are seen in this trace file? So now it's not only getting the packets, we need to find a way of counting those. And, oh, that went a little too fast. So first of all, I'm gonna read the response codes because I don't know which response codes are in there. Um, I do know from theory that uh, all the 300 response codes are indeed uh, redirection response codes. So I check all the HTTP responses and I check which response codes are there. I'm going to sort it and unique it to see which, one, which different ones are there. And I see that there are indeed uh, redirections in this trace file. And this is another not T-Shark specific thing, you can do this in Wireshark too. Another nice filter that you can use ranges since I think two dot something. Yeah, at least in Wireshark 3 this works and I think it's been working since 2.2 .2 or 2.4. Um, this means give me all the response codes where the value is between 300 and 399 both included. You can also use a space and then add another range or add a sing single uh, value. Um, but in this case, I'm only interested in this range. And you can see that there's quite a few uh, redirections here. And let me see what the question was again. Oh. How many HTTP redirections are seen in this trace file? Well, of course, I can count this by hand, but that's not the purpose of this exercise. I want to have an straight answer without any manual intervention. 
So I'm going to pipe the output and do a word count minus L, which means it's a utility that counts words, and you can instruct it to count lines as well. So that's the minus L um, argument. So this gives me the amount of lines, and that's the amount of packets that were in this trace file. Um, then you have to take something into account. When you, when you do this kind of stuff, um, there's protocol preferences that change the behavior of Wireshark and also change the behavior of T-Shark. So whenever you have, you're doing something that can be, that can be different depending on the uh, uh, protocol preferences, you, may, you need to make sure that you, you're selecting the right protocol preferences for your command. Like this question, how many times is the HTTP response time greater than 500 milliseconds? Are we talking about server response time, or are we talking about transfer time, including server response time? What kind of res response time are we talking about? And that's uh, based on, on that assumption, we need, either need to disable or enable uh, reassembly. So let's see how that, how that goes. So again, I have uh, the trace file. I'm looking for HTTP responses. I'm printing all the HTTP times, which is basically, which is the field for the response time of the request. And what Wireshark does is it looks at the, rec the, the packet where the request has been, has been seen, and then it, when it's seen the response, it will calculate the difference. But if you disable reassembly, the response is seen on the first part of the answer. If you re enable reassembly, the response is seen on the last part of the transfer of the, of the response. So there will be a difference. As you can see in, in this example, I just got one frame number. I'm using minus capital V minus capital O HTTP, which means give me full dissection, but only full dissection for these protocols, in this case only HTTP. For the other protocols, just use a one-liner. So that's just like opening up just the HTTP protocol in your packet details in, in Wireshark. So now you get the full dissection of the HTTP. So you see here the, the, the response time. But you can also see that this, this response was being generated by 55 uh, TCP segments, which means there was a first segment that had the header like this is a, the response, then there were 54 more parts of it, and then on the last message, Wireshark was able to re reconstruct the HTTP response and said, okay, I've got a response now. That also means that it calculates the difference between this last frame of the response and the, the request earlier. If you look at the, um, the, the preferences, you can look it up by using T shark minus G current prefs. It will show you all the preferences from the, from the current uh, profile that, that's been selected, which it basically on T shark it uses the default profile. I didn't put it in a slide, but you can use a different profile as well. So if you have a good profile that works for you, just use minus capital C and then the profile name that you made in Wireshark and it will use that profile. So all the protocol preference settings will be taken from that profile in that way. But if you just use the default profile with minus G current preferences, current prefs, it will show you the whole list of preferences. And I'm actually uh, ex extracting only the ones that at the beginning of the line have a hashtag or not. The, the question mark means the previous character can be there or not, doesn't matter, I, I do either way. And then next to one, it should be TCP. So all the pr protocol preference for TCP, they start with TCP, they are listed now. And as you can see, they're, they're all by default because if they're not default, they would not have the, de the hash in front of it. They're all default, and by default, Wireshark will do reassembly. So now I'm gonna experiment with that. I'm going to force reassembly, even though it's not necessary because it was by default. But I can advise, sorry, I can advise you to always force it if, you, if it's relevant because you don't know what the profile ends up like. Maybe somebody changes your profile if it's a multi-user system or you change your profile and forget about it and then your script starts working funny. So this is the same result as, as last time. But now I can do it the same with disabling reassembly. And as you can see, I just picked two examples. There's more that are different. 
But I picked two examples where you really see that the, di the difference in response time is quite large. So in this case, there was uh, 51 milliseconds to, um, this is actually strange. That shouldn't be lower than the other one. Hmm, that's interesting. I need to look this up. Here it says, I'm doing reassembly and my response time was 51 milliseconds, including transfer. And then in this one it says, oh, it's 200 milliseconds, not including transfer. How does, so something is fishy in this, this example. So look, let's look at this one then, because that's kind of showing the, the, the problem. This response was only, almost one second, and that was including the transfer time. But when we remove the transfer time and just get the, the, the time to the first packet, it's 157 milliseconds. So the transfer time was about 720 milliseconds uh, in total. I really need to look up the other example. I want to do it now, but I have to present. OK. Um, so the, the, the question was, how many, uh, ACP, uh, how, how many ACP responses had a, uh, server, or had a response time larger than a half a second? So I can now do the count again and filter where the ACP time is larger than half a second. And with reassembly enabled, there were 30 responses that took more than half a second. And if you disable reassembly, then it was only two that had a server response time of 500 milliseconds. So this is how you, uh, so if, you got, if you're gonna automate this in, in your production environment, please take care of your, uh, of all the protocol preferences that are important for your, for your study, for your results. Then there's a question, what file was last modified on May 15th, 2017? How can we, how can we know if a file was last modified? There's a header in the response that says, um, Let's see, HTTP last modified. So there's, a, there's in the HTTP response, there's a, a header that's, that uh, tells the browser how old this document is. So if I look that up, um, I'm reading the file, I'm looking for requests and responses, and of those uh, packets, I want to see the frame number, the request URI, and the last modified header. And what you see is that the request is in one part and the request URI is in one part, in one packet, but there is the last modified is in another packet. So if I'm filtering on the last modified, I lose access to the, um, the request URL because that was in a different packet. So the request was here, there I have the output that I need and the response was here and there's, there's the filter that I need. So I need to have a mechanism somehow to combine these two. Actually, in, in recent versions of Wireshark, there is, um, uh, there is a header in the response that, that tells you the URI, so you have access to that. But let's say you, you want to have the user agent instead of the URI. That's not there, so this method is still needed for those cases. So looking again at the, at the, um, the full dissection tree, I can see the URI here in the request. I can see that there's a response in frame eight. And on the response side, I can see that there's the last modified header and it has a link to the request. So the request was in frame five. So we can use these values to combine those two. So first I'm gonna select uh, the packet that has the last modified in May 15, 2017, you, you see it here already, but let's filter for it. So I'm gonna filter last modified contains the string 15 May 2017, and that gives me just one packet. And it has a packet number 27, that's the response packet. But if I, fill, if I print out the field request in, it will print out the request where the, uh, the packet number of the request, where the uh, request URI is. And now things get a little more complicated because I'm gonna stack T-shirt commands. Mm -hmm. 
which means this is the, t the in, in purple is the same T share command that I had in this last example that's been transferred to this purple part of the command. And in red, you will see that there's a dollar sign, uh, parenthesis open, parenthesis close. That's a way of saying, okay, execute this command and take the output from this command and fill it in in the place where, where, this, uh, where this is. It's the same as backticks, but these are a little more readable and less uh, error prone when you try to type them over. So I kind of switched to, the, to this notation. So now I take this, the output of this command, which is 25, and that's being put in here. So the, the final filter will be uh, filter number in uh, accolade open, 25, accolade close. And why do I use the accolades? Because there can be multiple, uh, multiple instances of this. In this case, it's the only one, but there can be multiple instances. And if I do that, you can see that it, it linked this 25 to this filter, and it shows only packet 25. Then I'm almost done. I need to extract the request URI, and I'm done. So this is a technique I use quite often. That uh, um, I've got another example. Um, if you have like a, a whole trace file with a lot of sessions, and, and you know that there's a PHP session of, of a user, and you want to have only the TCP sessions for that specific user with that specific PHP session ID, you can, do the, you can um, use this method too. So I have got a trace file, and in the cookie, there is some, some part of information that denotes a session. So I'm looking up all the requests that contains that, uh, uh, that session ID, but that's only the request, not the response. I can use that to uh, print out the stream numbers. So I'm going to do the same filter again, but now I'm the, printing out the st TCP stream numbers, and the TCP stream number is uh, every TCP stream from, from the first sin to the last ACK will get a stream number, so you can filter the whole stream based on that stream number. I'm piping to xargs. That's a command that will uh, put all the output lines in one, uh, in one line. It can do a lot of other stuff, but in this case, that's the, use ca the, the way I use this command. And you can see that I now have a list of all the TCP streams that contain this cookie. There are some duplicates, so I might want to sort them first. So they, these, let's see, seven, these seven TCP streams contain this, this uh, value in a cookie. Again, I can use that output for a new filter. And in this case, I'm writing to a new file. So I'm extracting from this file all the TCP streams where at least one request contains this uh, cookie value. And I'm writing that to a new file using the filter TCP stream in, and there's this list of TCP streams, so th this list. And if you look at the result, the original file had about 4,000 packets, and there were 1,100 packets left after this filter. I use this a lot, this technique. Yeah, yeah, good that you go to the microphone. Oh, Angelo, where are you? <laughs> oh. Test? Yes. Test. Good. Good. So I want to ask, uh, there's some good examples of some very long um, commands even before you pipe it to stuff. So I wanted to ask about uh, parameters and if there's what rules there could be about order of certain parameters like um, the dash Y, or no, sorry, dash T, mm -hmm. and then there's usually, you know, a dash E or one or more dash E's. So yep. does the lowercase dash E have to follow the dash T fields directly or I'm assuming? Uh, I don't think it needs to follow it. I think if you put it in front of it, it it's, it's fine as well, as long as there is a minus T fields with it. Okay. Graham, do you know? Is that? I no, me neither. I, I usually my my mind works like okay, I'm going to use fields, so I'm do minus t fields, and then then I'm going to use the fields that I'm interested in. So, but generally, I don't think there's any uh, command line option that's that's uh, sensitive to the order. Okay, so for for dash r for read, the the name of the file has to follow that, obviously, right? Um, 
Uh, yeah, no, not R. even. I think you can do display filter first, then minus two, then mi minus R, because they would, what, what, what T Shark does is it reads all the parameters okay. and, and changes some settings in, in some variables. And then when it comes to it, it will use those variables when it needs to. So it doesn't. So the order shouldn't matter. So it doesn't really process them at that same time. It okay. just reads them in and have them ready when they, they need it. Okay. Um, is it, uh, the filter expression would have to go last, though, right? Um, no, not really. If you like TCP port 22. Or yeah, if you not. do a capture filter, yeah, yeah that, that should be last. Yeah, and, and I always, to be sure, I always put it in within quotes. And if I'm using dumb cap, I always make sure that I use minus F because sometimes it, it messes things up if you don't. Is that the type of filter for minus that, that F? Minus F, minus small F means this is the capture filter. And then I think you can just put it in front of it as well. Okay. But Thank you. I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Um, another thing I like to do is to make top, list, top lists, top X lists. Like, in this case, it's a top one. Like, what is the fastest DNS response time in this trace? So, but the question could have been, show me the 10 fastest response times. And the way I do this, sort minus reverse numerical, and then head. So let's see how we can accompany it. Again, the, the basic is I need to have um, a DNS response, and it needs to have a DNS time, because some, some responses don't have uh, proper matching, so they don't have a, a response time, and I want to rule them out, because they, those will be empty lines that I'm not interested in. So I'm going to use this filter to, um, to create my, uh, uh, my list of response times. Actually, I think because DNS, DNS time is already only there in a response, so this is, this is not needed, actually, I think. So, but I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to print the DNS time, and I'm going to look at the first 10 uh, pieces of the output, so I have a, a, a general idea of what the output looks like. I can then sort it. Minus reverse numerical to get it in numerical order, and then I'll have the, the list. And of course, if I want just the first entry, I do instead of pipe head, which defaults to 10, I do head minus one to get only one entry. And I'm doing a little bit of an announcement here uh, that I, because there's a lot of uh, trailing zeros here that I don't like, so I'm going to remove the, the trailing zeros. Set is a stream editor, so it can post-process uh, uh, text data. I'm not really a set guru or set, but I, there are some parts of set that I really like, like substitute stuff. And in this case, I substitute a zero, one or more times a zero at the end of the line. I'm going to substitute that with a space and then seconds. So I'm transforming this part of the data into a nicely formatted. And you can have like the you can insert like the the the, the slowest DNS response was, and then you can do whatever you like with this. So that's another element that you can put in your toolbox for post-processing the data. And I'm I try to highlight all the new stuff in the in the in the presentation. Once I use something new, I try to highlight it in red so you can point me. Hey, this is new. Explain this to me, please. And if there's something not in red and you want to have explained, please ask me too, because I'm here to teach you how to do this and, and so you can really use it in your own uh, troubleshooting uh, projects. So we now had a top list. Let's see if we can cal calculate an average, because that's one question here as well. Calculate the average response time. That's just an awkward operation, pun intended because I'm going to use awk to, to solve that. Awk is, um, um, is a programming language, basically, but it's based on that it reads records from a file, and within each record, it can, you can uh, select um, items. So basically, the, the, in normal way, it's the, all the records are the lines in the file, and uh, the, the items, or the columns, or the... Um, those are the fields separated by white space. So which means I can refer to the first field in the output by referencing to 
dollar one, and in this case there's only one field, so dollar one points to the uh, response time. So if I add up for every line, I add up the response time, and I'm counting how many responses I've seen, then at the end, so after all the lines have been processed, I can print the sum divided by the count, which means that's the average response time. And that gives you one result of the average response time of all these requests. And you can extend this if you have multiple fields. You can do a lot of things with awk, but this is a basic example on how you can utilize awk to, to post-process the data that T-Shark outputs. How am I doing? So what time do I have? Like 11, uh, 12, 30, right? Um, you might have an early lunch, or you need to ask more questions. The, whatever you prefer. Um, sometimes the fields are not, the, sometimes there's more occurrences of, uh, of fields, and that kind of complicates things. So this question, what is the largest DNS TTL value seen in a trace file? Um, let's first, before solving that, let's first look at another way to find fields. There's a, again, t shark minus G, but now without the current prefs, but just plain minus G. It will show you all the field names that, that t shark and Wireshark know about. And it will show you in a very extended way, like um, there's an address type, let's see, I can't, if, I'm, if there's one that I really, well, there's a description, then there's a field name, there's the type of the field, um, and I'm not sure what the other ones are. But there's an extensive list of things that uh, are being displayed. I can't read this properly, so I'm going to post-process it. Again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's awk that can do this. So if I do minus T fields, awk, and then now I'm not uh, only interested in separating the fields with uh, white space, I want to specifically say it needs to separate on, on tabs because that's what the table was uh, delimited by. So I'm going to say my field separator is a tab character. And then when the fifth field is DNS, so I'm only looking for DNS protocol fields, I'm going to print a little formatted here, the third field, the second field, and the fourth field. And I'm going to format it with a uh, 40-character um, string, left, leftly, um, uh, well, aligned on the left, yes. And then another string, and then a string within uh, brackets. So that gives, and, then, and of course, I need a new line because I want to have every entry on a new line. So that means I have the field name, the description of the field, and the type of the field, which is, so I can use this to now find the field that I'm interested in. I'm interested in a DNS field that has something to do with time, because I don't know the, the field name. I expect time to be in there. And you can see that there now I find my, the field that I'm interested in, dns.response.ttl, and that's the time to live, and it's a 32-bit integer. Okay, that's good. We can use this. Like I'm using, I'm reading the file, getting all the packets that have a response TTL, and extracting that response TTL. But something weird is happening now, because I expected just one number, and I've got a lot of numbers with commas in between. Why is that? Yeah, there's multiple answers in the, in, the, in, the, in the DNS response, so there's multiple TTLs. So I need, since I'm interested in the longest one or the, the highest number, I need to put these, I need to extract these and make sure that they are each on a separate line. And that's where um, the TR comes in. TR is a, it should be red because it, this is the first time that we see it. Um, TR means translate, and you take a comma, or you take a string with a, like, it can be multiple characters, but this time I'm only interested in replacing the comma. 
which you can do like replace A, B, C by one, two, three, and it will replace all A's by one, all B's by two, all C's by three. In this case, it replaces all my commas by a new line character. And as you can see, it had 176, 7196 and 16 on the first line, and in the new output, they're on separate lines. So now I can do my old trick, sort them, and uh, do a head on it, and then just take the, the first one. By the way, for the people taking pictures, uh, the presentation will be online after SharkFest, like every presentation, or most of them. So feel free to take pictures, but please know that they, it will be online later. This is, uh, okay. Um, now we're gonna dig a little deeper. What names are associated with a server that established a TLS 1.0 connection with a client? Like in Wireshark, you would try to find a TLS 1.0 connection and then do your thing interactively within the packets. But let's see what we can do with T-Shark. I'm gonna combine some fields and see what we can do. So first we need to find the TLS 1.0 packets. TLS handshake type equals two means server hello, because I'm interested in server TLS 1.0 packets. So there are indeed uh, server hellos. And I wanna make sure that I'm only getting the ones that are TLS 1.0. And TLS 1.0 has a, a handshake version of uh, 301, because SSL version three had 0300, and this is just TLS 1.0. So that gives us a list of IP addresses, but we were interested in, uh, in the server names. So how can we get the server name? It might be in the server name indication field, the SNE. You know what the SNE is? It's within TLS, there's an extension that you can use to already tell the server which website or which host name you're gonna visit. Because if you have multiple websites on one IP address and they're for different host names, how can you present the certificate that's needed? Because you, have to, you need to have the certificate for the specific site that you're visiting. So there's a server name indication that tells you I'm gonna visit www.google.nl or .com and it will be in the client hello, so when the server needs to send a certificate, it can select the proper certificate for that connection. So that might be an option to, uh, to explore. So as I'm doing a T-share command with this extension server name, and um, let's see, so I'm, I'm extracting all the IP addresses for, or all the stream numbers for the ones that had a TLS 1.0 connection, and then for all those TCP streams, I'm looking if there's a server name and there's no output. So there were, for these servers, there was, in the client hello, there was no uh, SNE available. So that didn't work. Can it be a common name in a certificate? And I tried to look that up in, in, in Wireshark for a second because it's really hard to get the certificate or the, um, the name from the certificate in T-Shark. So I cheated, I used Wireshark. And there's no server name. There's, there's some internal server name string, but it's not the server name that people connected to. So that's not the answer. So what now? Any idea? DNS. DNS, very good. DNS to the rescue. So these are the two IP addresses of all the servers that had a TLS 1.0 connection. Why not look if there's DNS request that had, an, uh, that had a response that corresponds to these IP addresses? Because when you try to connect to a server, usually you do a DNS request first, and then when you get the response, you go to that IP address in your uh, TLS session. And that actually works. So again, in purple, the previous command that, that results in these IP addresses, 
And now I'm just going to look for any DNS record where there's an A record that had this IP address in it. And I'm going to print the response name. So that's the name uh, that was requested that resulted in this IP address. So now I'm combining. It's both IP addresses, but in one case it's an IP address within the IP header, and in the other case it's an IP address within the DNS A record header. So I'm combining those two. Okay, for the last example, let's see, I'm really running short. Um, like we said, the, the, the selective acknowledgement, it had a little caveat, so I'm going to do that again. And I want to make sure that it will always give the right result. So I, I created a couple of uh, capture files. Like you can see in the capture file name, if SAC was enabled on the client and if it was enabled on the server. So in the first case, it was enabled on both. And if I use the tshare command that I used in my, in my previous example, it will correctly show that there's no system that doesn't support SAC. So that's a correct answer. So I've made that green. The second one, when the client has um, enabled uh, SAC and the server didn't, the correct answer is that the server IP address didn't support SAC. So that's correct too. So that's green as well. But then when the client doesn't support SAC and the server doesn't support SAC, it, this answer is correct in this case. But it's if you look at the next example, if the client does not support SAC, but the server does, the way SAC works is that if the client doesn't present SAC permitted, the server will never answer if it supports it or not. So whenever there's a request where the client doesn't support it, the, the SYNAC from the, from the server is irrelevant because you can't determine whether it actually supports SAC or not. So I want to exclude those false positives from my trace file. And I'm going to walk through this. Like, uh, this is getting a little more complicated, so let's walk through this step by step. Um, whenever SAC is, uh, is not supported by the client, I don't need to look at the SYNAC because it's not relevant. But whenever SAC is permitted by the client, I also want to look at the SYNAC from the server to see whether it supports it or not. And that's what this filter does. So I'm going to run through this. So if I always am interested in SYN packets because that's where the SAC permitted option is. Then either my ACK should be zero, which means it's a SYN packet, not a SYN ACK packet. Or it can be a SYN ACK packet, but only for those streams where, and I'm going to do this first. So I should have done this one first. So I'm going to look at the trace file. I'm interested in the SYN packets. The, and not the SYNAC packets, so the X should be zero. And I'm interested in all those SYN packets that have the, the SAC permitted option, because those are only the streams that I want to look at the SYNAC packet. So this gives me a list of all the TCP streams where the client SYN packet supported SAC, because those are the ones that I'm interested in to check the SYNAC as well. So combining that with the AC equals one means I'm looking at all the SYN packets and all the SYNAC packets where the SYN packet had a uh, SAC permitted. And then you wonder why there's this high value here. If you do this, and the result is an empty list, that means that this, the syntax will be accolada open, accolada close. And if you do that, t shark will say it's a, it's a syntax error because it needs at least one value in between. You might want to fix that because it breaks automation. Uh, but for the moment, that's the way uh, this operator works. So I added in the highest value for this stream value that's possible. I've never seen trace files with more than 4 billion uh, TCP streams. So I'm pretty sure I'm safe here. But um, you might have a one-off here if you have a really large trace file. OK. so. This results in all the packets that, um, all the SYN and SYNAC packets that we're interested in. And now from within this set, I want to get only the packets that don't support SAC permitted, don't support SAC. And then I'm going to 
print IP address of those. And then you can see for um, client enabled, server disabled, like this situation, uh, sorry, client enabled, so this situation, it will show you only the server address, which is good. And if I do the same thing for client disabled, but server enabled, which we had here, client disabled, server enabled, and it's false because it only should print the client address because for the server address you, you just don't know. And this with the new version, you can see that it only prints the, um, the client IP address. So this is like the last step in your, like for me, doing these kind of exercises, at first I want to make it work. Like I've got this trace file and I need to find out how I can extract the information and once that's done, that works. Yay, I've got, the, I've got the solution. And then I'm start, okay, but is this, the, is this the proper solution? Is it always true? And the, the, don't I have false positives? Don't I have uh, exceptions, one-offs, whatever? So I'm checking my results against the trace file. And then I'd like to use other trace files to verify the result even more and, and build on it so it will be a robust answer. And, and usually you have to do a, lot, uh, a couple of steps before it turns into an answer that you can trust when you automate it. That was the uh, takeaway of this exercise, this last exercise. So in short, T-Shark uses the same dissection engine as Wireshark, so you, you can utilize it uh, in the same way. And when you combine it with scripting, it can be very powerful, and you can comp complement your, your GUI skills. And with, the little, with all the little building blocks, and you combining those, it really becomes powerful. Any questions? Could, could you use the microphone, please? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Do you have to have the file uh, extensions in quotes? Do I have to? Uh, like your commands, you, it seemed like some of the times you were quoting and sometimes you weren't. I'm quoting the filter sometimes. Yeah. yeah. yeah if flags. Do you have to include that in the uh, double quotes? Uh, yes, you have to because there are spaces between the parts of the filter. And if I don't put them inside quotes, those will be read as separate command line options. So I need to have, like I'm, I'm telling T-Shark with minus Y that there will be a filter here. If I don't reuse quotes, it will see this as a filter and it will see this as extra command line arguments. But my filter is the whole string, so since it's the whole string, I put it between quotes. Excellent question. And the other questions? Okay, if you try to solve this packet challenge with T-Shark, like if you run into, tr into trouble, there's quite a few questions that you really, I think, need T-Shark to solve it. So if you, if you can't work it out, just come visit me and I'll help you. I won't give you the answer though, but I'll, I'll help you formulate the T-Shark command. So feel free to uh, hop by and, and I'll help you. Oh, and one last request for me and for Janice. Please fill up the guidebook feedback form. Just, you've got half an hour before lunch starts, so you'll be fine doing that. And if you have questions later on in your life, if you want any help, feel free to email me. I usually answer emails if they're like small questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. If it's like uh, 20 questions in a week, I might start discussing uh, payment options. What? Oh yes, of course, you can ask questions on ask. Who uses ask.wireshark.org? Nobody? Well, yeah, use your suspects, of course, but, and you, good. Yeah, if you have any questions about Wireshark, T-Shark, uh, all the other tools that are included, or packet analysis in general, ask.wireshark.org is a great place to ask those questions, and Graham and I are there, and you, you are there answering those questions, so feel free to, uh, to visit that. All right, we have an early finish. It was a shorter session than I expected. I hope you liked it, and uh, see you later.